from the Denver Broncos Media Center. Welcome to Broncos Country Tonight with Ryan Edwards. Do you know for sure Philip Lindsay fits with what Pat Shermer I don't wants know. That, to do? Yeah. It, didn't, it didn't look like it. It didn't look like that. Yeah. It didn't look like that. that. That's no knock about his talent because we know he's talented. We know he can he can be play at elite level at this this level. But and, it's got to fit the system. But it's got to fit the system. Yeah. It's got to fit what the OC is thinking, and it's got to fit whatever they're doing the blocking scheme. Remember how his numbers were with a fullback versus without? Oh, uh, stupid. It, right. So, but you know, Pat Shermer doesn't run with a fullback. Yeah. Like so that that's where it's like you're saying. Well, maybe Philip Lindsay goes somewhere else and has success. And that would be unfortunate because I think a lot of people in Broncos country, they love Philip Lindsay. We oh, want yeah. to see him oh, succeed yeah. here. But at the same time, there's just an understanding of we're not running that kind of offense anymore. And unless the OC is going to adapt and say, I'm going to work with your strengths, Philip, we're going to find ways to get you in space. We're going to find ways to get you, you know, whether it's screens. I don't or, think he needs a fullback, though. Why does, it doesn't need a fullback. His just numbers are better with the fullback. Yeah, in, in a year. But I think that he could be an effective, you know, guy running with the one back sets too. You know, this is interesting. You got to have the tight ends involved. No, it, you got to use those tight ends like like. Uh, but you know, I also don't want to judge like, the running like. like uh, you know, blocking backs like fullback. Well, know. no, hey, one hundred percent. And and Noah Fant is improving in that. Albert Okawebenam, I think oh, you man. need a little bit more from him on that. But again, you know, second year he'll be better. You're gonna make me cry. Hopefully, Nick. <laughs> hopefully, Nick Vanette uh, improves there too. But this is the thing: like, we didn't really get to see the full experiment very often. Because you remember, Pat Sherman was pretty excited about having both running backs on the field at times and yes. being able to to mix and match and do all sorts of different things. How often were they actually healthy on the field together at the same time? That was the case all across the team, though. And, you know, the ideas that the coaches had of what would work and what wouldn't work, that was destroyed by injuries. And not not just the Broncos either. That was across the league. Offensive plans, defensive plans shattered. We wanted to see Bradley Chubb and Von Miller. I know. That's another one. I was thinking about that with Von, and we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit later on. But I was thinking about that with Von because the Broncos have a decision to make. And it's like, man, we saw those two on the field, Bradley Chubb's rookie year, and it was special. Yeah, man. It was really special. We didn't see enough of it. And then it was cut short the next year because Bradley Chubb got hurt, and then now Von Miller got hurt. And, and that'll, be, that'll be significant if you have to move on from Von Miller because we really never got to see that oh, man. come to fruition. Yeah, I'd, I'd pay to see that. I don't know. But coming back to the running game, what if I were to tell you that the Broncos running backs in the final six games, the seventh best running Seventh best rushing attack in the NFL. How many yards did we average each game? Over 138. <laughs> Not bad. It's pretty good. Not bad. Now, and, so and what, that's, what, what changed? Well, maybe some of the, the schedule. I mean, they, they, I wouldn't say they played all softer teams, but there were a couple of teams in there, mixed in there, that they found success against. But I, I'd say a lot of it, and you correct me if I'm wrong, I'd say a lot of what we saw down the stretch for the Broncos was the chemistry finally kind of coming together for everybody. The oh, offensive right. line. Because we saw a better play from Lloyd Cushenberry, did we not? Like yeah. Lloyd Cushenberry played every single snap all year long. But it wasn't until the end of the season when it really started to seem like it was setting in from him. Now he's got to be better against some of those bull rush. But otherwise, I thought he improved as the season went on. But my point is, is we started to see it all kind of click. The problem I thought for the Broncos all season long was as certain parts of the team started to get their act together on the offense, the others were still yeah. not quite there. And then they, they changed places. And then in really in all three phases, they couldn't play a complete game. But they started to play some complete games there down the stretch. And then on the offensive side of the ball, it seemed like they were all seeing the same thing. Now, you correct me if I'm hey. wrong. Great stats, but we were five and two. Those last seven games. Five and two. Yes. No, two and five. No, right? I was gonna say, yeah. No, two, two and five. Two and five, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, it's like that's not right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if it had been five and two, you, it would have made your point. If we'd had Mace here, then it would have made your point, but two and five, you can throw those stats out the window. Well, you're talking about wins and losses. I'm talking about That's what it's all about. Well, it is. It, it's definitely going to be like that this year. But 
it's also, at least for a young team, it's also about the stuff that happens in between the 60 minutes too. And at least as you're trying to learn. And that was the thing that like, I think people get lost in a little bit. At the Buffalo because, Bills game. Well, now that was a, that was a disaster. Like that was a, that was a bad game. Like they played a bad game. They, 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 they played against, in my opinion, what was the best team in the AFC at that moment. Let me ask you something because this, this has been kind of popping around in my head for a little bit. Might even run a poll on this a little later on. Uh, the Broncos are tasked on the defensive side. They got some question marks on the defensive side yeah. at corner, like at all three, oh, fa- yeah, all yeah. three levels. Yeah. Yeah. So what is going to be the most transformative for this defense? Like, like what, what would take this defense and, and make the biggest impact if you hit on either a corner, a linebacker or you I guess what, edge or D line? Like, like bro. what would, what would, what would be the thing that you absolutely have to hit on this off season? I'm going to be honest with you. Back when I played, I used to be like, man, you know, we, we, we got a good defense. You know, defensive backs, we're balling. And you go back and look at the film, though, we had amazing defensive linemen who put pressure on the quarterback. And without that, <laughs> we would have been on skates back there. So, for me, I, 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 got, I would have to say interior defensive linemen, a dominant Aaron Donald-like interior defensive lineman. That's, hey, he's going to wreak havoc. One guy, they're not going to be able to block him. Coming up next on Broncos Country tonight, more with Steve Atwater. We're going to talk about the top inside linebackers in the draft, Micah Parsons and Jeremiah owosu Koromora. We'll get to that next. Welcome back to Broncos Country tonight with Ryan Edwards. All right, let's talk about the two top inside linebackers in the draft. You went and looked at Micah Parsons from Penn State and Jeremiah Awusu Koromora from Notre Dame. Two guys that some of the mock guys out there have put to the Broncos. Uh, a lot more corners recently in most mocks, but those guys are still kind of out there. What did you notice? Who do you want to start okay, with? So, so do you think they're the top two? I do. Yeah. Well, Jeremiah Owusu Koromora is an argument that he's a safety. That's what I. Okay. So no, I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying some people think he's an inside linebacker. Uh, ben Albright thinks he's a safety. I'm kind of inclined to agree with him. He is a safety. Okay. <laughs> in the way in the world, he's going to make it in the league, get inside linebacker at 215. Yeah, well, no. No. So, uh, and he looks on the field, even in college, he looks. Like a smaller, and he he got some wheels. He can go perfect safety. He can be a first rounder to safety. Okay, would you take him? Well, I mean, you wouldn't draft. Would you draft him as sort of positionless, like a guy that you can, like kind of like uh, was Isaiah Simmons last year, where you can kind of move him around? I don't know because he's he's been he's played safety before. He didn't play safety last year. Now I know guys who have done that. Cornell Lake was a guy back in our day who he played linebacker at UCLA, undersized, went to Pittsburgh, bought out as a safety. Uh, he he made that transition extremely well. I think he was a second round draft pick. Uh, but you know, it can happen. Well, what are you gonna do with them? Like, I mean, if, if the Broncos draft Jeremiah Owusu Koromora, what are you do? What, like, what what do you immediately say? You play safety. Okay, that's what I'm saying. So the Broncos just drafted a safety. Yeah, they still need an inside linebacker. <laughs> <laughs> but I wouldn't go that route. Okay, so you 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 would take him off your board because what you need, if you're drafting it, you need an inside linebacker. Yeah, if that, I'm looking for an inside high. linebacker, I'm not drafting. I'm not drafting him two fifteen. I can't do it. Okay, can't do it. Won't do it. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, so Jeremiah, what did, what did you think of him in general? Like, what did you think about when you watched him play? Great speed, great instincts. He looks like a smart player. Um, fast. He can cover. <laughs> we know he can cover. He can cover backside of backfield, tight ends. See him cover receivers. He can he good side to sideline to sideline uh, speed and, and and agility. And he's physical. He's he's a physical guy. 
215 pounds. For me, looking at Parsons, dude, sometimes on plays, he just get lost. Like hmm. running back, fake one way, he just goes that way, and the other guy going the other way. Like, expand your vision. You can't bite on something like that. So I, I, don't, I don't think he is able to read offenses as well as he should. Yeah, but Parsons here. Yeah. Okay. I'm talking about Parsons. Parsons. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's a lot of different ways to say it. So what, what is it? Uh, I mean, so you don't sound very impressed by him. No, I, I love his physicality. I love his speed. I love all that. But sometimes it looks like you don't know what the heck is going on out there. Mm. So another guy you probably would not take at number nine. Uh, I wouldn't. Okay. That doesn't mean somebody won't. Well, yeah, but I mean, remember, like, we had, like, Devin White and Devin Bush oh, no, no, that no, one no. year. Like, what what do you think about him compared to those guys? In the physical area, it stacks up well. But just in terms of, you know, just, just seeing a running back go one way and him just take the fake bait hook line and sinker, and the other guys run the other way, that for me is a problem. I don't like seeing that from, from linebackers. I like, I like guys who can, you know, kind of sniff it out, can, you know, got good vision and, you know, good instincts and, you know, have done their homework to know that I'm not going to get tricked on, you know, on a fake handoff. And the guy's running all the way over here, and I'm, I'm all, almost in the backfield. Like, oh, damn, you don't have the ball. Well, can you coach any of that? Can, the, can you, like, I mean, because some of they these co- things. They coach it in college. Well, no, no, I mean, right. So, I mean, this comes back to kind of like what what part of instincts, you know, like when you talk about the instincts of a player, what what part of that is coachable and what part of it is just innate? That part, uh, some of it's, I would say, is innate, but it's, a lot of it's just, hey, watch the film and then, you know, going over it time and time again and, and you know, knowing how to recognize it. Man, it, it, it's guys who they'll play 10 years in the league. They still do the same thing, bro. Mm-hmm. Which guys would you like? My guys, like like plant my flag. These are the dudes that if if they're on the board, I'm either trading up for them or I'm I'm rushing Come on to, in, in the first round of the guy anywhere, anywhere first around. second round. I mean the guys that, that we've looked at so far because we've gone through a lot with a lot of corners, gone through a lot of uh, we've gone through some safeties, some linebackers, some defensive line. I, th- I think we've done some edge. I can't remember, but w- what are some of the guys that you'd say like you're absolutely. 100% would love to have these guys in the Broncos. Okay. Uh, Richie Grant. Oh, yeah. Safety. Um, Andre Sisco. Safety. Wiggins. Safety. Mm. Oh, you know Caleb Farley. You don't even have to. Yeah, he's he's really special. You know, and, and I would take Patrick Sertain as well, but if it's between the two, mm-hmm. me personally, I would, I, would, I would take Farley. That's just me. J.C. Horn. J.C. Horn is my dude. Got some dog in him. I like his swagger. I like his physicality. And, you know, there are people that are worried about him being a little too grabby. And and certainly that might happen a little bit uh, right off the gate. Oh, I'll take that, though. I, I, I'll take that over a guy who's, you know, afraid to get up in a guy's face. I want somebody that's going to, hey, well, you might beat me, but I'm, I'm going to be right here. Mm-hmm. No, he he's he's definitely one of those guys, and I just don't see him backing down from anything. Like he he just he play, plays fearless, and yeah. I'm not. And this isn't a like against Farley or against Sertain. I'm just saying that you like that. Yeah, it's one of those traits that you like. Coming up next on Broncos Country tonight, Tim Jenkins joins us in studio, the quarterback whisperer. What are his favorite quarterbacks in this upcoming draft, and who should the Broncos target? We'll get to it next. Welcome back to Broncos Country Tonight with Ryan Edwards. Tim Jenkins with Jenkins Elite. You can check it out, JenkinsElite.com. Also, make sure you subscribe to his YouTube channel, All Things Quarterback, does some really great breakdowns. Uh, Speaking of those breakdowns, let's get to some of these quarterbacks. So you're talking about ranking them, and I know you have your own kind of rankings of that. So when you... Like, like you're ranking those independent of where they actually end are up gonna going to get drafted. Yeah. Right. And, and so we have to kind of do that. Right. Because yep. there's no there's no ultimate way because you say, well, I love Zach Wilson. Right. Yep. Zach Wilson's fantastic. But if he goes to the Jets, 
maybe he struggles there for a yeah. couple of years. You know, organizationally, they've got some stuff going on. Yep. It was the same thing for Washington for a long time. Like any quarterback that goes there, they're just going to struggle. Yeah. You know, Ryan Tannehill struggled down in Miami for a bit there. Now he's in Tennessee. He looks good. So th- that's always got to be a bit of a factor. But for you, like how, how do you, I guess, parse through that? How do you separate that yeah. as you're thinking about what these guys could be and then factoring in, but it's tough because if they end up going to the wrong situation, they might struggle and ultimately not become what I think they could be. I mean, that's such a good question. I, to be honest, I don't, right? I, I, I just, I literally build these rankings off of where, who I think is going to have you know, if we're going to rank them at the end of their pro career, where each of them end up. And that's why, again, I have Zach Wilson over Trevor Lawrence. I think Zach Wilson's a better player than Trevor Lawrence coming out. The Jaguars will not take Zach Wilson, right? right? And that's what people get confused about on Twitter, too, and they get really mad. They're like, really? It's like, dude, I'm not doing a mock draft. Like, I don't know. I don't know who's in the quarterback market. I don't talk to anybody. I'm not, like, hounding GMs on the phone, like, (laughs) Ben is and being like, you know, I, that's, I'm not doing that. I don't know. And I, I don't know him. So, you know, I, I, I just think Zach Wilson processes the game at a higher level. Trevor Lawrence struggled so much in one of the games that I watched in mm-hmm. terms of processing rotational coverage, we'll call it, which is just starting in something and getting to something else. Start in cover two, get to cover three, whatever it be. Which you see a lot in the NFL. Oh, my gosh. And then if you're a rookie, you're going to see it even more. Yeah. Because, because they're, they're going to take that. Yeah, and D coordinators, listen, D coordinators literally will sit in rooms and talk with their staff and say, we'll bust three or four coverages, meaning we'll have a blown coverage this mm-hmm. week, to give our guys more freedom to show certain things because they know they're going to get two or three takeaways from it. So it's going to be even harder. And that's where my worry with Trevor Lawrence is. Now he makes up for it because he makes some throws that no one else on planet Earth can make with the exception of Mahomes. So that's why you have him at two. And then I have Mac Jones, Justin Fields, interchangeable at three, which a lot of people are mad about too. And it's like, listen, I, you know, if you want me to be honest, the kid that I would be really happy, the kid that I wish was still further down in the first round is who I think I would love to see Denver get, which is Mac Jones. Right. If you could have traded back, got some capital, and then picked him at 23 or whatever – Man, that's a heck of a pick, in my in my opinion. So, you know, but Mac Jones, I just think, one, I think he's a guy who keeps a hit list. I think he's going to keep track of everyone drafted in front of him. I think he's going to make sure that he last, he's the last one standing. I just think right. he's built like Brady. And then he processes the game at a high level, and everything that we're sold about him, he has a much better arm than we're sold. And the pocket wasn't as clean as everybody's telling you it was. right? That, when I watched the tape, I was surprised how much pressure I saw on him. Mm-hmm. Let's not forget, right, no matter how good Alabama is, they're playing in the SEC. And I said it last week, and I'll say it again, you know, everyone's getting paid the same in the SEC, right? It's a lot of money. There's a lot of bag men there giving guys cash. <laughs> but, you know, Mac Jones, that's why I just I believe in him. Justin Fields, I also think, is a dynamic playmaker, and I think Ohio State absolutely wasted him with what they were running in the national title. Mm-hmm. He's a kid that if he would have gone out and if he would have had any help from his offensive coordinator – Literally, Ohio State ran what was perfect for Alabama's, like they have this zone combo man. Mm-hmm. Basically, what Nick Saban drew his defense up for is what Ohio State gave him on a silver platter. So it was just this poor kid's out there fighting his, you know, fighting his tail off. And he's got no shot. If they would have given him a shot, he would have jumped up in the rank. If he goes and beats Alabama, that would have been a different conversation. Oh, yeah. So I think he's a tremendous player. Um, and then I've got Jamie Newman. We already talked about him. I just think yeah. he processes the game at a high level. I think he's got everything you want. The Georgia stuff's a concern, depending mm-hmm. on what actually happened. Um, and then I have, and then I have Trey Lance because I just think, I, I just don't think there's enough developmental time in today's NFL for him. I, I think for for Denver, this is where I think you and I uh, do part a little bit because I I don't like even if you take Mac Jones in the twenties, like somehow yep. you get lucky enough to do that. Like, are you starting him week one? Are you are you going to go that route? Does that mean that uh, the veteran hedge you brought in is that ex- expected to be? Because what if it's one of the the lower guys? I mean, yeah. like, I mean, not that you're going to go Jeff Driscoll here again, yep. but I mean that that was the veteran hedge this last go round, and you don't want to go week one starter yeah. that that route because your rookie needs a little more time. Yeah. Well, I mean, listen, the no brainer thing to do if you're the Broncos is to trade for PJ Walker, right? But <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, you know, it's a great point that you bring up, which is if you do get him plus a veteran, the quarterback room looks a little funky. Um, 
you know, maybe that's where a kid like Jamie Newman comes in, right? If you yeah. grab him day two, day three, the dynamics kind of different. You know, let's be when I when let's be honest. When we first started talking in January, Mac Jones wasn't. No, he wasn't one he, of the top guys. No, he was a he was a second or third rounder. Yeah. Now he's top ten. You know. Well, Mel, we know of about course, Cor- Mel, Mel Thirst is. Yeah, and of course, Mel Kuyper's watching the breakdowns. Of course, so, I mean he's know? bringing up Tom Brady I mean, clearly. <laughs> but, but no, there is, and this is another mistake, Ryan, that you that you just brought up. That's perfect. Which is, we do this every year. Every single year, we hear the next quarterback class sucks, mm-hmm. unless there's someone like Trevor Lawrence. But usually we always hear the next quarterback class sucks, and if we don't get someone now, we're screwed. And here there's four great quarterbacks in this draft. I mean, I, how many? I can't tell you how many times I heard it was like, it's going to be easy no matter who you take, Carson Wentz or Jared Goff. You're right. Oh, well, <laughs> not now. No. I mean, and a, lot, a lot of times with these situations, I mean, we, we only have history to look back on. And we know that there's a certain percentage that are going to miss. I mean, they went back over the last 20 years and only 40% of first round quarterbacks even won a playoff game. Thanks for watching Broncos Country tonight. Tune in to Broncos TV every weeknight at 630 right here on KTVD Channel 20.